do they do what you expect them to do? And the answer is uh, very often no. You may have a very mm, clear understanding of what should be happening, but people are very happy to do th their own things, right? Welcome to Process Pioneers, the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers, key influencers, and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process. Welcome to the next episode of Process Pioneers. My name is Daniel Rayner. I'm the host of Process Pioneers. And in each of these episodes, I get the absolute privilege of sitting down with different uh, BPM practitioners and professionals. And they come from all different areas of this world, whether they're working internally at an organization, whether they're coming in as, as consultants and, and seeing quite a diverse range of organizations, or whether they're coming from a, 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 through an academic lens where they're doing research, they're understanding, well, what does the future of this field look like and today I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with Hayo Reyes. Now Hayo is a full the full professor of business process management at Utrecht University as well as Eindhoven University of Technology and is also affiliated with QUT here in Brisbane. Uh, so those those two universities that I mentioned, they're in the Netherlands, I believe. Um, but I'm really excited for this conversation today. Hiyo, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for uh, for also introducing me. Yeah, well, people may wonder, how does one person have so much time to work <laughs> at so many universities at the same time? But it's it's obviously a trick. Uh, when you, I can recommend it to anybody really. If you <laughs> if you work, if you have more than one, one workplace, people are always fine when you're not there right because they will assume that you are at the other other spot which gives me a lot of opportunities to do all kinds of interesting things myself so that's that's i think that's the first trick i uh, want to share with everybody <laughs> so that's, that's right so no i'm a, i'm an academic working on, on bpm but haven't always been working in academia um in fact i it, it's in fact when i left the university when i graduated from uh, from eindhoven I, I really had the impression I would never be back uh, on campus. <laughs> I was wrong, obviously. Um, so I, I started working as a, as a consultant. And uh, before that time, I was not really, really uh, into process, processes, analyses. I, I never heard it was, it was during the 90s. I didn't read all that stuff from the, from the BPM or BPR gurus. But what I noticed when I became a consultant that there were a lot of companies who were uh, they were interested in, in re-engineering uh, and in particular uh, there was a kind of technology at that time which was extremely popular at least in the Netherlands uh, workflow management technology so right. uh, I became because I had an IT background I became an IT consultant and uh, I spent well much of my time uh, helping to implement Kind of workflow or workflow uh, systems in organizations within banks, insurance companies, governmental agencies, um, and I've, I've been I've, I've done that for for years uh, really, and only after uh, I spent seven to eight years in in um, with consultancy companies like Accenture and Deloitte, uh, I, I um, became aware of a. Uh, position, a PhD position, uh, again at Eindhoven University of Technology, um, uh, where they were looking for somebody who would want to combine uh, a consultancy job with doing a PhD. And that for me at that time was, was, it was really attractive because since I had been seeing a couple of BPM projects in practice, I also realized that there were very uh, persistent problems that we kept running into and as a consultant you have well a very limited amount of time to carry out your project and we were always very very eager to deliver something within the a lot of time but there would be never extra time to to look at you know uh deeper problems and i thought well doing a phd project uh could be a, could be a good uh, good opportunity to do so so I, I, I then started my PhD project. I've uh, with my, the topic of my uh, of a thesis is um, business process management for the service industry, because obviously I had been working um, in, this, in the financial services uh, industry right. um, mostly. Um, and that was a great journey. 
uh, that was the time that I got to know, um, for example, Will van der Aalst, um, a very well-known um, academic in the uh, in the process uh, in the process sphere. He was my supervisor, uh, so I spent a couple of years uh, doing my PhD thesis and combining that with the, with the job that was that was uh, out, outside academia. That was fantastic. Uh, I wouldn't do it again because uh, it was also. <laughs> extremely challenging there were always deadlines that were interfering you were writing a paper for a conference <laughs> you also had to deliver uh, for a client that was yes. terrible so after i finished my phd i uh will van der Aalst asked me to join eindhoven university as an assistant professor and that was also the time around the time that i became a father and uh i thought well as a consultant uh i never knew where my next day would bring me Right. Uh, that doesn't really that doesn't really match well uh, with uh, the role of as a father I had I had uh, imagined for myself. Yes. So I thought why not why not take it take it slow for a couple of years, uh, be a teacher you know very structured pattern of hours etc. And uh, but I always thought that would be a temporary job. Yes. So after I spent eight years as a <laughs> <laughs> as a teacher as a lecturer. An assistant professor, I had to say to myself, I have to stop kidding myself. <laughs> I'm now, I'm now an academic. I'm an academic. And, yes, and, right. And, and since that moment, I, I moved on and um, I made a bit of a journey. I uh, worked in Eindhoven for quite some time. Uh, I've been working in Amsterdam at the Free University over there. And two years ago, I moved to Utrecht, where, as you as you mentioned, uh, I'm the head of a group business process management and analytics group. So that's a group of around 10 people. Yeah. And um, yeah, there you see also the interest that I have. You see computer scientists really working on the technology of supporting and implementing process management. And there are also people who have a much more organizational interest. So they are much mm -hmm. more interested in organizational performance, um, work performance um, and, and more the, I would say, more the managerial uh, perspective of process management. And that, that suits me perfectly because I'm, I'm somewhere in between. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing um, that, that history there. I think that obviously you've got such a, a vast, diverse sort of range of experience there um, being a consultant and working um, with a, a number of organizations, because I'd imagine that, you know, when, when you're, when you're implementing BPM, when you're putting BPM into practice, you, you're probably going to encounter a number of challenges and hurdles and curveballs um, yeah. that you didn't learn in theory, um, but yeah. now you have to face um, yeah. um, when push comes to shove. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think until this day, um, my practical work uh, still gives me inspiration for the things uh, that we do uh, on the mm -hmm. academic side. Well, obviously, it's been some time ago, so I cannot really pretend to have a, have a, a thorough understanding of what modern projects are all about. <clears throat> but the other good thing of having worked in practice is that I have, I think I have quite a bit of a network with people who are on a day-to-day -day basis mm. still implementing uh, BPM um, uh, technology or, or trying to help organizations to become more process oriented. And that network is something which, which really serves me well. So to give you an example, I'm, um, I'm, also, I'm, I'm advising a, a startup company in uh, Australia and Melbourne Yes, um, right. The process diamond. Yes. So uh, these are guys who have a very uh, interesting kind of technology, and since it's a startup, and they are they are exploring all kinds of options on the market, and I often uh, know the right people for them also to talk to, uh, to try out their uh, their technology, or so or to tap into a particular problem. Uh, that others have identified so that is yes. that is also serving me in my teaching uh, um, so i'm fond of inviting also uh, friends of mine or, or business associates to you know teach to my students so that is that is i think wonderful yes yeah, yeah, oh, yeah you mentioned of course you mentioned that uh, for an understanding of the obstacles and hurdles that this mm. is also a positive thing and that's that is true i think um in my time as a consultant i have seen um 
how people struggle with with the process concept if i explain it to my students students often think and tell me this is so obvious right why is there a discipline around it why yes why why all the fuss right if you explain right. it to me it makes so much sense and then i'll tell them well this makes perfect sense to you uh, probably because you are thinking from sort of a clean slate right how would i design my organization but if you if you encounter organizations and how they have evolved and the power structures within these organizations and you start telling them about process oriented approaches that's that's an entirely different that's an entirely different situ- situation yes yes definitely and i think what you what you're um you know t- touching on there is you know the challenge for an organization to adopt uh, a new way of management or, or understanding yeah. their processes yeah. improving their processes yeah. Is, is that sort of tradition of we're doing business how it's always been done, would you say that's one of the biggest challenges for an organization when it comes to BPM? I would, I would definitely say so. So I think that many, uh, there is such a strong, I think one of the most important things that organizations suffer from is turf wars, right? Um, right. There is this very strong socio socio psychological phenomenon that people are very fond of those who are in their group. Uh, that could be their the business unit, their department, right? And everything outside is is unfriendly territory. Right. Um, I, I've seen this also with students who graduated with me, and then they go into business, uh, into a company, and they say, "Well, I started working with a bank, and I always thought that our competitors would be the other banks, but they're not." The other competitors are the other departments, right? <laughs> because they are also fighting for our resources. Right. And you know, every dollar uh, can be spent only once. So if they get it to hire somebody, uh, we don't have it. If they right. can do an IT project or, or buy the license, we cannot. So this, this kind of uh, us against them, that's an extremely strong force within many organizations. So that is, that is of course, and it's a, a very known uh, phenomenon for, for process uh, process management people. This this functional thinking. We train people to think in functions, and this is exactly being transferred to the organizations that we see nowadays. So to break break through that kind of mindset is I'd see is is the is is the obstacle for for um, uh, working in a more process oriented way. Yes, yeah, definitely. And I think obviously BPM um, aims to provide or create that cross-functional view of an organization to have all of the different functions, the different areas work together. Um, And and you you mentioned there that, you know, everyone's very protective of their patch. They're very protective of their area. How do do you go about, I guess, aligning that um, or tying that into the overall strategy? Because I I feel like if... Um, if everyone's looking at the overall strategy or, or looking at, well, what, what, as an organization, what are we trying to achieve? Um, yeah. Then there can be more alignment there, but how do you um, orchestrate that to happen? Yeah. Well, I don't have, a, I don't have a very, I would say there's not a, a single answer to, to doing that, but what I've noticed, and this is also something I think that is in one of the earlier interviews you've had with uh, Marlon, Marlon Dumas, Right. Uh, this was. This was. I think you also addressed this, and uh, I really like what Marlon uh, said there. Um, be, this process-oriented approach is such a, in my view, powerful method that you can take the big issues which are uh, exist within an organization as a starting point to tailor this process-oriented approach to address those problems. So. Mm. My experience is that the most effective way is to really take the challenges of our organization, as you say, also the strategical challenges, uh, perhaps as the starting point. And you will you will often find that this this more integrated approach, this more um, united uh, approach, this horizontal approach, it doesn't matter how you call it, is often the way to address these challenges. There are, I mean, the challenges which are functional are perfectly addressed by functional units, right? Right, right. Everything that you keep struggling with has to do with coordination between different people. It has to do with 
um, sharing resources. It has to do with uh, taking away, uh, let's say, inefficiencies across your organization. So, and, and, it, and it depends. So there are organizations who are uh, struggling with um, um, compliance. Uh, it's a big thing. Uh, so uh, last year or the year before, there were uh, Dutch banks um, were fined heavily because they didn't right. pay attention to uh, how their uh, accounts were being used by clients. The, right. uh, the law, the Dutch law, is that they have to inspect whether there is a legitimate use of these accounts, uh, whether they are used for, for money laundering and all these things. And they were simply not. There was there were no active. There was no active um, monitoring taking place of this thing. Mm. It, mm. it cost them billions, right? Well, this is I think this is a perfect opportunity to say well. Um, you need to have processes in place and this these monitoring processes they cannot be just carried out by one specialized unit because these accounts are tied to uh, clients who do many things within your organizations probably yes. you have to you have to install something which monitors these things across your organization and that is i think is a very good example of showing how challenges of organizations can be met well there are many other examples healthcare we do a lot of projects in healthcare um, obviously, uh, the things which can be done by local clinic or a local department, they can optimize these things themselves. But um, cases where you see where different medical disciplines have to work together, patients are bounced back and forth between all these uh, departments. That's where the trouble is. That's where the uh, uh, where people also suffer from it health-wise but also right. of course, start complaining about things things get lost as mistakes are being made well then that is the starting point for talking about a more process-centered approach but that is the that's the buy-in and that's the that's the first stage and there obviously then even if an organization starts uh getting convinced of, of the potential advantages then there was of course how do you how do you get them to work in a process-oriented way that that's that's yet another hurdle Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. And I think one, one, um, one way to articulate the advantage of it is to, I guess, point to real life examples or real life case studies of, you know, this is how this organization has implemented this. And this is, this is what they got out of it. And I, I think obviously organizations have to be careful not to just try and copy what another organization is doing because um, you, your organization will have its own culture and will have its own sort of nuances that are going to be unique for that organization. But um, uh, but that's something that, yeah, that, that the executive team in particular will be interested to hear is, yep. well, if, if I put this into practice, um, what is yep. the return on investment? How does it align? How will it align to our strategy or how will it support our strategy? And how long is that journey or that process is going to take? Um, so yep. do you have any examples where um, an organization has adopted BPM uh, in whatever capacity or whatever form, uh, and it has delivered significant value. And, and do you have a couple of examples you could share? Well, um, let me see which, um, what are good examples. I think, um, unfortunately, the, the, and this is also a, a sort of a um, in, uh, insight that we that we build up. For example, um, research that Michael Roseman has been has been doing about how mature organizations are with respect to process orientation. Uh, they have their different instruments to measure this, and I'm telling that to to show that for different organizations the journey is very different. If you start wow. in a, a sort of a wasteland where people have no idea what the word process means. Then obviously this will take longer, but you also see organizations where there are already pockets within an organization where people start experimenting with these uh, these approaches, and that is a, a different journey. So, what I what I can tell is is a sort of a pattern that I see recurring in organizations who try to move upward with with these process uh, with a process oriented mindset and a way of thinking. I think that from from what I've seen that all these organizations experience a, this diminishing um, kind of, of, of group thinking, this in and out group thinking. So right. I think that 
all organizations start ex experiencing that people see a sort of a wider, get a wider perspective on the benefits of uh, working together, working, aligning things horizontally. And that is, that always happens. And that is not a very, I would say not a very, it doesn't, it doesn't directly translate into sort of financial, uh, financial benefits, but it is something very structural. If, organ if, if people within your organization start looking beyond the um, 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 the goals of their individual unit or their individual department, when, mm. organ when people start thinking and collaborating in such a way that they have this wider uh, perspective, that has benefits in all kinds of all kinds of aspects, um, mm. and that is something that you can then exploit. You can exploit or exploit. I would say build upon. That's a better word. Uh, you can build upon with. Uh, more concrete projects or for with more concrete objectives if you you can for example you can also play with the uh, performance indicators and people will also be more willing to contribute to the bigger good of the, the, the um, uh, of the company but let me let me try also to make it a little bit more concrete so what I know that is um, I, which is an example that I really love um, uh, about an organization that started uh, working in a much more process-oriented way is um, um, a windshield windshield repair sh uh, repair shop in in the Netherlands. So um, what they do there is when whenever there's your uh, the, 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 your windshield of your car is broken and they fix it, you have you are in touch with different people, right? You call them. Uh, you have uh, somebody who schedules your appointment. You drive your car there or they come to you mm -hmm. um, you meet with the uh, repair service person um, and there is sort of an aftercare there's billing and all this so, so you engage with a couple of people but the great thing is what they've been doing there is they make sure that the feedback you give them they channel that back to every single person who has been in touch with you right, right. And that is, I think that's such a great idea. And I think that is a, that's a practice that any organization can, can implement because everybody gets to share in the, uh, let's say, in the satisfaction of the person who used your service or your product, right? And yes. obviously they have to keep track. They have to really, and I think that's a, that's a key thing. They have to keep track of which client engaged with which people within your organization. But they have that in place so they can always share well something went uh, something went wrong however he or she picked that up repaired that or or took care of the customer or channeled this back etc overall the client was still happy that really helps i think also to see the benefits of working in a process centered way right you, you share also the the successes together so mm -hmm. i remember when i was a student i was working as a in a, in a pizza, pizza restaurant and i was the cook I was one of the cooks, but we never shared, the cooks never shared in the tips, right? The waitresses got the tips. No, <laughs> we, no. they, they didn't share it with us. <laughs> but why would we care to, you know, deliver the pizzas in time, right? We, right. We, we never, we never, we never saw anything of the, of the, of the, 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 the gratitude of these clients. Yes. Right. And, and that was, so it was really the cooks against the, the waitresses uh, in, in that, in that time. So I think that's, that's a good metaphor for um, what you can get out of a more process centered way of working. Yes. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I agree. And um, obviously getting that, um, getting that sponsorship or getting that buy-in from all of the yep. different stakeholders. Um, it's, yep. it's not, um, it, it's going to be different in each organization. Um, yep. uh, it's going to be different uh, who you need to involve in the, in the process and, and also how you approach it, because sometimes yep. you're approaching people that um, they've been doing that process the same way yep. for the last two years, three years, five years. Yep. Um, yep. And, to try and implement change or any improvements, yeah. it, it might then it might prove difficult or challenging. Um, and I think the other thing there is, you know, you might Im implement something and some people may adopt it, other people may not adopt it. And trying to understand, well, okay, why why are some people adopting the change or why is nobody adopting the change? You know, this this looks good on paper, but is there something else I'm not aware of? So are you able to talk to us about, um, I guess, trying to bring the right stakeholders on board when doing those process improvements to make sure that they are adopted? Yeah, yeah. 
I love that angle, Daniel, because I think this is also consultants. I think there is this huge hubris. We're going to tell the organization how to do it. <laughs> we are the experts. <laughs> uh, just listen, sit back. And <laughs> that, is, that is, of course, an extremely, uh, that's, a, that's, that's a pitfall. That's a, that's a big danger. You have people working in the organization, doing their work for years. You're going to tell them how to do that better. That, that's that's um, I think that's something that we, we all should reflect upon. There is this a huge reservoir of knowledge on how to do work properly. So it's, I think it's a very nice, uh, perhaps a nice um, bridge to uh, some of the research we are doing in, in Utrecht and that I'm really excited about. So um, obviously there was this, this, this huge development in, in the process management uh, discipline uh, that relates to process mining learning from data um, how processes unfold in, in, in practice and that's one of mm -hmm. the, the things that process mining brings it's a technological uh, uh, approach one of the things we are in doing in Utrecht and that leverages that that also that tech, tech, technology is work around mining so what we do is we look at how people within organizations work uh, with the particular emphasis on the question do they do what you expect them to do? Um, and the answer is uh, very often no. <laughs> you may have a very um, clear understanding of what should be happening, but people are very happy to do the, their own things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think a natural reflex of many organizations and perhaps process consultants as well is to say, well, we have to stand that out. We have to, <laughs> we had the plan, right? Listen to the plan. I'll explain <laughs> it to you one more time. But um, as you explained, people who have already years of experience of doing something properly, they often have a good reason to, um, uh, to do things the way they do. And in, in um, empirical work we've done in healthcare, we, we also found out that some of the workarounds, so that people do, work things, do things differently than, than they, were, they were meant to be doing that, has benefits, but not only benefits for themselves, which you may assume that they, they work in a way that to, uh, to lower their own workload, to, to finish early, etc. No, these are, people often do things which are have bigger benefits for the patient involved, for themselves, but also for the overall organization. And that right. would be extremely stupid, of course, to say, no, 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 we thought of a better uh, <laughs> way of working. <laughs> That's what you should do. So the, the, the change here is, so there are uh, different people in my group uh, who are working on this, Inge van der Weert and Iris Berenpoot, and they have been working on fantastic work uh, to, to show that if you start investigating these workarounds, comparing them with what you should, should have been happening and what is happening, and then engaging with these people who, to find out what the motivations are to do these things, that this can actually be a, a, a jumping board to improve uh, over there. So right. uh, to, to adopt practices. Sometimes it's really wrong what people are doing. They didn't understand it, could be a knowledge problem, could also be um, uh, even more problematic, could be fraud or um, negligence, uh, and then you have to do something else. But you can use, let's say, this, this lens of, uh, of, of understanding what people why they do things differently as a, a sort of a way of improving your design and um, not sticking with the original plan but together with people within the organization uh, uh, reach something which is even better and this is of course you can imagine what this does for buy-in right yes if people yes. are if people are aware of that their ideas and that their practices are being appreciated and even being adopted in uh, the grand scheme or whatever that's i think that is that is that's that's, that's, that's wonderful people will will also be more willing to share um, um, their insights where, where things could, could could even be improved and i think that is i think that is one of the key things that um uh if you can instill this mindset between people it's not wrong to um uh, keep on changing keep on improving etc i think then, then then you really get to the level of being a process-centered organization that, that keeps on improving mm -hmm. yeah that's fantastic that's great i think that as you were saying if, if people feel like they have the space uh 
and, and the environment to bring forth ideas, to bring yes. forth suggestions. You're yeah. unlocking a, a huge potential there of, of different ideas and suggestions there that yeah. otherwise yeah. Will, will never be heard of. Um, yeah. And yeah. if there's if that environment or that culture isn't fostered, then you yeah. might have a workforce out there that have all of these brilliant ideas in their head, yeah. but yeah. it never it actually help. gets... That's right. That's right. Yeah. Never gets voiced or anything like that. I think that's amazing. Yeah. So can I give you one more example? Because it, I, I was really excited about it. And it's also, I, it was also, I, I, it frustrated me so much this weekend. I was reading about the, uh, so obviously we are um, in, in Europe, just as in Australia, we're now at this, it's these vaccination programs. And I read an analysis of how this is uh, happening in Denmark. And I already told my my family why are things in Denmark so much better than in the Netherlands? We always have that feeling about movies and and, and plays and all these things. They're less dense and they do more. They do things better than we do. So we are often <laughs> frustrated about this. And then I read about the, the how they approach this vaccination challenge. And uh, in the analysis I read, this is exactly their mindset. They try to all the time uh, change uh, the practices around this vaccination program. So I read that um, after a, a week, they found out what the perfect time is for uh, uh, to keep people within the clinic when they are vaccinated before they release them again. It's 15 minutes, 15 minutes. 15 minutes is exactly the right time to see if there's an allergic reaction to um, um, the vaccination. But then these people are moved with, you know, uh, ever so slightly to to leave because the next people have to use that room but they found this 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 exact time and it's also it were there were signs everywhere 15 minutes no less no more right on, on the on these rooms <laughs> people time it themselves also i can go and this but this is something that they only found out when 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 they started doing this right and i like right. that mentality i like that people are you know embrace this, 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 this improvement over time, gradual changes, gradual improvements to make the things flow much more easily. That, and I can assure you that goes much more difficult in, in the Netherlands. They are much more rigid. We've thought of the program, trust us, we are the experts, we're going to do it in this way. And it, only when there was a, you know, parliament starts discussing these things, is this really the right way? Then things change. I think that's a, that's a big mentality uh, problem. Yes, definitely. I think that, you know, if it, if it takes a long time to implement something or to adopt something, by the time you come around to putting that into action, um, yeah. maybe it needs to be changed again. Um, yes. And so there is a need to, and I think looking back over the last year, um, COVID has really um, disrupted a lot of different industries, a lot of different organisations yeah. and, and have yeah. forced organisations to uh, be quick to adapt and quick to change and, and quick to figure out, well, Absolutely. Ha how, are we go how are we going to co cope uh, with this new yeah. way of life or this new way of working. Um, what, what have you sort of noticed over the last year um, when it comes to COVID and how BPM has played a part in the last year? Yeah. So one of the things that made uh, the biggest impression on me is the uh, is technology. How technology has, you, has been helpful for organizations to deal uh, with this, 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 this sudden disruption. Uh, mm -hmm. through, through, these, uh, through the COVID uh, pandemic. I've seen how, um, so I've seen two, two types of, of situations. I've seen organizations who uh, have been struggling with uh, a sort of a huge uh, demand for their services in unexpected ways, right? Remember the, uh, the airlines uh, which had to deal with, with enormous amounts of customer requests about their bookings and et cetera, right? This is, they were not at all prepared for this kind of load. So that's one mm -hmm. type of organization. All of a sudden there was a, a huge load on one particular part of your organization that you didn't anticipate. And yes. then there was the other side, all of a sudden organizations have to come up with new things that they didn't anticipate, right? So we right. talked about the vaccination program. Um, uh, so there are all kinds of associated uh, procedures, all kinds of things, new kinds of registrations, new kind of um, uh, processes that you have to start. And even though it looks very different, 
uh, the challenges. What I've seen as a sort of a recurring pattern is that organizations who dealt with these either uh, uh, scaling up the capability of a new process or very quickly building a new process capability, they have, <clears throat> uh, at least from, from the organizations that I can see, they have uh, built on uh, um, uh, similar technology. They have uh, in particular used robotic process automation technology to mm -hmm. um, have these software robots that mimic very, I would say, basic uh, actions that people can take. So it's it's often not rocket science. What what is what is needed to scale up, uh, for example, to analyze all these customer requests with an airline. Where it's it's there are the similar questions. This is my booking. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the status of of uh, this flight? Will we will, will I be able or can I get a refund? What is the status of my refund? There is this, this recurring patterns in all these things. It's just the volume that is that is that is. That's daunting, right? Yes, yes. They've been, they've been using these technologies to start analyzing these requests and to start automating parts of these things. And the the one of the obvious advantages of, of using software agencies agents is that you can copy these things, right? You can spawn off new robots. You can scale with this. And I see this on the other side as well. Of organizations who start these new programs, for example, these vaccination programs or uh, and there's, there are obvious things which need to be repeated. You have, you have the selection of patients that you or, or, or citizens that you have to select uh, certain criteria. You have to send them an invitation. You have to schedule something. And there again, it's not so complex what you have to accomplish. What is difficult is that you have to do it again and again and again. Right. So what I see is that this that there is technology is a huge factor in um, uh, in being able. Uh, to deal with these disruptive uh, disruptive times it's there's simply not enough we don't have enough um, workforce all of a sudden to 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 take on these things we have to do that in a more automatic automatic way because because of the scale because of the the huge differences and the huge peaks that we have to mm. have to deal with and that is yes. i think that's yes. successful organization it's also one thing that i uh, enjoy investigating at the, the time how technolo technology uh, helps to uh, deal with deal with this kind of disruption. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And for those organizers, for those people that are listening right now, that um, yeah. you know, there there are organizations out there that uh, technology can. Um, can sometimes seem very exciting and, and, and very yeah. innovative, which it is. Um, yeah. And they might see one of their competitors adopt um, techn certain technology um, and yeah. it work really well for them and then decide, well, we need to yeah. adopt that because we need to keep up with them. But yeah. what are, when it comes to BPM, what is, are there fundamentals that need to be in place or, or what, what should an organization consider um, yeah. Or do, do they need to consider anything before jumping into technologies like RPA? Yeah, so I think that this, the piece of advice I would like to extend to organizations is to, uh, to, do, to, to pay attention to um, data, um, um, uh, to, to the data administration or, or archiving data, storing data about how you are doing things, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that is, so to mm, register what happens at, at what time, who's taking care of what, if you have such a registration in place and it doesn't have to extend across the entire organization, but if you can identify parts of your organization where you have data about what you're doing, this is, I think, a, a, a great stepping stone for uh, starting automation, um, automating things, because it gives you a very tangible, um, gives you a very tangible yardstick. You can, right. you can, you can compare uh, what you're going to do next with how it happened previously. So I see a lot of, um, I think that there's a big risk of doing things and not being able to see what the effect is of, of doing right. that. So if you have right. a sort of a, um, place where you have the data in place, it makes it also much more tangible what you what you accomplish with your your project. Um, the other thing I would recommend is to do something which is not so which is which is rather 
obvious in the sense that you can imagine the benefits of working th doing things in a different way. It doesn't have to be a sort of an initiative that, that you know, is super complex because there are so many departments uh, involved. If you can already start thinking about the synchronization of two groups or two departments, and you can imagine what the benefits would be if they, if they start working together more closely. That is, I think, that's the right way of doing it. If it's so complex that you cannot even imagine yourself what the benefits would be, it, it makes it so difficult. There will be so many, there will be so much resistance to these, these complex things. Take something simple. I mean, I'm very much a bottom up person in that sense. Uh, if it looks like a good idea and if you can imagine how it would work and all you need is uh, uh, a little bit of extra coordination, a little bit of extra support of sharing data, uh, and you can measure what the immediate effect is of, of doing that because you have a registration in place which shows you that this was how it was before, this is how it is, how it's happening now, that gives you the buy-in to scale up, to try it out somewhere else. It gives you the advocates, yeah, work with us. Okay, well, let's try it, let's try it at another uh, another place. So that is mm. that is uh, that is how I recommend. Uh, how I would recommend organizations to start doing these things. It's, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's not very. I would say it's, it's. It doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like much, but it's at least something which um, catches on in this way. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think starting small, starting on on a small project, on a, on a, on a small size, on a small scale, it allows you to to test. Um, that thing that you, you're wanting to implement, that those changes, those improvements, it allows you to yeah. do that on a scale where um, there can be, there still can be significant value, um, yeah. but but it allows you to really focus on one particular area. I think if yeah. if you spread your focus too thin and you're yeah. you're concerned with too many parts of the business, you're not yes. going to reap the maximum value from no. any of those. No. But no. if you hyper focus. That's where you can see yes. the value. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I've heard a number of examples of that. That's um, one large telecommunication company here in Australia where um, before, before the executive team had really adopted BPM yeah. as, as a, you know, a process centric way of managing yeah. their organization, there was one yeah. particular team that adopted it uh, and, and were really driving it. And, and they, they proved its value on a project level. And then the, the biz, the wider business unit took notice. And then, so they yeah. adopted it yeah. and then the department took notice and they adopted it. And yeah. before the, they knew it, the executive team were taking notice being like, why is this area of our business outperforming all other areas? We need to implement what they've implemented enterprise wide, but it I all started it. with starting small. I love it. I mm. love it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And yeah. what I also like, and, and that is, I think it's also a very realistic point that you also make is at some point, you have to make this connection with the executive level, right? Right. right. Um, so in, in your example, I'm very glad that also the executive level took notice and started adopting, uh, adopting this. There has to be a connect at, at, some, uh, at some point. And this works, works differently in, in, in different organizations. Um, so when, um, when it is not so obvious to the executive level how this how this how this connection is with the local initiatives, of course you have to put extra effort into it. But uh, um, yeah, I really I really like your example. I wish that that this would happen in <laughs> for more organizations in this way. Definitely, <laughs> that's yeah. great. And when we're when we're talking about the the future of BPM and what that looks like, obviously we we've already started touching on different topics like process mining and RPA. Um, but if, yeah. if we look forward over the next two, three, five years, where do you think organizations need to be um, putting their time, effort and energy to um, if they want to um, be part of that leading pack as opposed to being left behind? Yeah. So indeed we, we covered the technological, uh, technological side and that would otherwise have been really a big part of my answer. Technology is, I think, technology for process mining, technology uh, for process automation. I think these technologies are, are extremely, um, uh, have extremely provide many opportunities. But I really also think that um, organizations may want to invest in their sort of a, um, 
methodological repertoire. That sounds like an academic, what I'm now doing, but uh, getting to know, getting to know methods to do new things. So um, uh, one of, the, one of the, the gurus in our field, Michael Roseman, who's very um, excited about innovation, uh, for example, He's doing great work in also helping organizations to think beyond the things they're doing right now, right? To start right. identifying new business opportunities. What are the things we are not doing, but we could be doing, which generates new revenue, creates new products. Uh, I myself, I'm working on uh, methods to uh, try to improve existing processes. Uh, how can you do that better? Um, there are methods for... Um, uh, for example, finding out where which which processes are vulnerable for risks, or or um, 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 maybe disrupted, and so sort of a vulnerability check. I think that it's a pity that many organizations are familiar with some of these, you know, obvious or not obvious. I would say mainstream techniques like uh, six sigma or whatever and think now we know everything right there's right. any problem is a six sigma problem let's just start <laughs> analyzing doing the statistics and we will improve it i think there's um there's there's so many interesting um new methods for organizations to start improving themselves finding new opportunities that, that that repertoire that extending your repertoire and not being good at what you're doing right now but getting good at getting better, right? Mm, I think mm. that is the, that is the that is the well, not the challenge. That's the opportunity. Mm, uh, mm. I also think, and that is and that is perhaps something that, that the academics um, should should also tell themselves. And I see, fortunately, I see a lot of colleagues who also want to engage more with with uh, organizations. Uh, we should also, from the academic community ourselves, be more prominent explaining them the kind of things we we've been doing so we've been talking about work work around mining i think mm. that's 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 that has so much potential to understand where your people within your organization what they are doing mm. um, so better understanding what what you can do what you can improve i think that's that's a key that's a key asset for for many organizations to keep on improving and yes. to keep improving you have to do more you have to know more about methods how to do so yeah. Yes, that's right. And I think some of that inspiration can come from observing um, well, what are what's happening in, a, in other industries. Um, for yeah. example, I was having a conversation with uh, someone from a, a local government today, uh, and they yeah. were saying how the members of their community of their council um, have a high expectation on the council, uh, because yeah. everyone else they're dealing with um, throughout their day to day, they're dealing with banks, they're dealing with utility yeah. companies, they're dealing yes. with retail and, yeah. um, they're, they're, they're going to expect a, a similar, similar level of service, um, from each one. If they get an amazing experience with their financial institution, for example, yeah. that's going to set the new baseline of what they expect. Um, and right. so councils, for example, if they're not delivering, a similar level of service as say a financial institution, yep. then there could be potential for more complaints. Um, yep. Wondering why am I waiting half an hour when I just got yep. off the phone with my bank and they were able to solve my problem in yep. five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very good point. Yeah. Mm. So that is, that's not, that's even goes farther than comparing your direct competitors or similar organizations and how they perform, but it's much more the kind of product or the kind of service you're getting. Why would it be so more, much more difficult to do, you know, uh, give me my, uh, my, regist my, my uh, registration as a civilian. Why is that much more difficult than that a bank gives me my account information, right? What, what, yes. what's the, what's the big, what's the big difference? Yes. I think that's, that's true. I think that that will, this is happening, I think. I see this also with my students who, who of course, wonder uh, why things within a university, why they have to take so long if they Run. have sort of a commercial, uh, commercial service, uh, which they are exp using, exploiting, which is more or less providing them with similar information. So I think expectations go up and people will, well, uh, governmental or, uh, organizations have, of course, enjoyed for quite some time. They have sort of enjoyed. You cannot do without them, right? There's not an obvious 
other yes. party who can yes. do this. But there will be at least pressure. There will be expectations mm. on that they start performing uh, performing better. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's good. And um, and for those people that are listening to this, obviously we've been talking for around 45, 50 minutes now. And oh my, um, yeah. <laughs> obviously we can only really scrape the surface on a number of different topics. But um, for those that are, that are listening to this and and maybe this conversation has sparked ideas inside of their mind. Maybe it, uh, what you've been saying has really challenged their thinking. Um, yeah. Where would you encourage them to go if uh, they now have an appetite, they want to learn more? Uh, maybe they're wishing that this podcast went for another hour. Um, <laughs> maybe they're w wanting to ask you more questions, more follow-up questions. But um, yeah. for, that, for, for those people that are listening and they want to continue their learning about um, BPM and, and, and what, does it, what is it going to look like in the future and how can they apply it at their organization? Where would you encourage yeah. them to go? Yeah, so um, perhaps, a, perhaps a, a couple of short points is um, people are always, uh, um, this is an open invitation for anybody who, who wants to engage with me, with the group in, in Utrecht or with Eindhoven. People can always uh, uh, contact me. Um, very open to that. I, I often think that, that uh, research is more exciting when you can also apply it in practice or the other way around, be inspired by practice to, to start doing new things. So that's that's an obvious way. Um, I'm afraid I have to do a lot of, a bit of product placement then here uh, <laughs> by, by mentioning um, a textbook uh, on process management, the fundamentals of business process management, <clears throat> which I co-authored with Marlon Dumas and with Marcello La Rosa from Melbourne and Jan Mentling. Um, uh, that is a sort of a, it's, it's, it's a textbook uh, and people don't have to read it from page one till the end, but it at least gives a sort of a comprehensive overview of all the things which have to do with, with process management. It's much more a, I would say, a management than an IT book, but there are pointers to uh, information technology. Um, it was a wonderful book, um, but I'm afraid I have to Google it. It's a wonderful book. For, I think it's called Chasing the White Rabbit. Um, a good friend of me, uh, Michael, uh, Michael Zumeulen, who is teaching at uh, Stevens uh, Institute of Technology, recommended it to me. It's a wonderful book. Uh, I'm Googling it right now um, because it, it shows it's not a very obvious management book in the sense that it, it, it advocates process management, but it shows how different types of organizations uh, perform in relation to each other. And I really remember that, for example, um, there was a comparison of the um, American nuclear service, the, the, what's that, the submarine service, the submarine service, the, the American submarine service was compared to, um, to NASA, uh, highly technological organizations, but where the submarine service works in a very process-centered way, uh, NASA doesn't. And right, this okay. kind of comparison gives, I think, mostly for people who are more, you know, working at the executive level or, or trying to understand the added value of process management. Uh, I think that's a fantastic book because it shows how little practices of more willingnesses of people to coordinate their work, to think beyond the, uh, the borders of their own unit, which tremendous benefits uh, they can achieve in, in, in terms of overall performance, safety. Um, uh, so if, if you don't believe, that part, I, but maybe I should I should send you the link so I can uh, you can really uh, put it up perhaps with the interview. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That would be that would be amazing. Well, hi. I just want to thank you for sitting down with me. Obviously, as I mentioned, then you know we've been able to scrape the surface on a number of different topics. I've certainly been gleaning a lot from you, and I've been taking a, a ton of notes. And I hope the people that are listening to this episode have also been jotting down some notes. But I guess the beauty of technology is we can rewind and we can go back to the start and we can watch it over again. Um, and but speed I just it up to... if I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> Do that too. Yeah. But on, on behalf of the Process Pioneers community, I just want to thank you uh, for sitting down with me. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to get a lot of value out of this. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Daniel.